The question remains, will there be silver and gold available to fulfill the needs of the American public? Today, we're going to focus in on silver. I've asked Pat to have a discussion with me. We hear it all the time. There's a silver shortage. Some people even claim silver is the most undervalued asset in the world. We're going to talk to Pat. Welcome to Ron's Basement. Hey there, Ron. Thank you for having me back. I see the Bears are all the well, you know, doing pretty well anyway back there, but no blindfolds removed. Remember, solidarity, red shirt going on here with Ron's <laughs> basement. So well, I just uh, noticed that. Thank you, Pat. Yeah. You bet. If, if, yeah. I'll try and wear the red shirt every time I'm on with you, Ron. So, you know, well, we, we got to stick together and we got to stay off any Star Trek episodes. That's right. That's yep. right. That's right. So so you're you're working to uh, forward legal tender legislation throughout the country. Part of that is with silver. And I know you've been a mm -hmm. proponent of silver and gold for many years. Is it true? Do you think that we are at some point here going to face a shortage of silver in the United States? Well, I, I used to say that um, it, for dramatic effect. I did. Mm -hmm. I mean, anytime I was on you know someone's platform and we talked about it, the the issue is that there will never ever be a shortage of gold and silver. However, the cost where where the value is right now, supposedly the value, cannot stand if silver and gold were used as money like it used to be, because there's just not enough of it to go around at today's prices. So yes, uh, silver and gold would have to go up in value if it was used, you know, in coining money making, you know, bars, you know, for easy transactions. Yes, there would be a problem. Plus, not to mention depositories. If states started uh, doing depositories all over the United States, that would also take a lot of gold and silver off the regular market. And that also would, you know, make it rarer than it is right now. And one thing I want your audience to know about is that above ground, there's a heck of a lot less silver to be had than there is gold. The reason being is because silver is used up in the industrial process. I believe it's seventy percent of all silver that's mined. Uh, Definitely, and in fact, probably eighty percent of all silver that's mined gets used up in product. It gets used up in making water filters. You know, making circuitry for you know printed circuit boards. It gets used up for you know uh, medical needs. Uh, for making medical equipment, as well as uh, pharmaceuticals, and the list goes on and on. It's in your windshield in your car. Um, uh, so, so I've been told before, and I'm not sure this number is exact, but I hear that there's about eight or nine pounds in silver in every single car. Wow. You know, just making up circuitry, what's in your windshield, you know, da di da di da um, So is there enough silver to go around if we start coining money again? Yes. Is the price going to have to go up a lot? Probably. Yeah, so I like, like that's that, what I that, say. That that old saying, "Price fixes everything." Or maybe mm -hmm. when we're talking about uh, about silver value, right? I mm -hmm. mean, price is just the measurement and fiat paper money. But if that value of that silver, so as it becomes more scarce, the value will go up, and eventually people will be willing to convert their silver for other hopefully real assets that the the market will eventually uh, eventually the market will prevail is that is that a safe uh, a safe assessment in sure that regard? If, sure the free market will prevail you know basically if gold and silver is actually used as money we're not talking about gold backing money we're talking mm -hmm. actually using gold and silver in in transactions so i agree with you there yeah. and it's incumbent upon all of us to understand, I think, for the time being anyway, that the federal government and the Federal Reserve can't do this. They won't do it ever, ever. You know, all the wars that we're in right now, those would be virtually impossible if we were on a true gold and silver standard here in the United States. You know, all the entitlements we have right now, all you know, Social Security has been raided for, you know, since the 60s. There's nothing left in there but a bunch of IOUs. You know, we couldn't afford to make Social Security payments if we were on gold and silver uh, because they have used all that money up. They didn't save it. So there's a lot of things that would change in society if we went to gold and silver, but we would have an honest monetary system where they couldn't uh, easily promise money out of the Treasury to buy votes every single election cycle. Yeah, so you're 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 basically saying that if we if we were still on a gold and silver standard, 
uh, our elected officials would be forced to be responsible with how they spend our money. I mean, Absolutely, they would. <laughs> they would. And, it, and it's not just federal, it's state as well. Mm -hmm. You know, st there's a lot of states that are engaged in uh, deficit and debt spending right now. And, and that's in, with the fact that they're getting, you know, historically high tax receipts. Instead of cutting spending, they, they spend more and they don't have to. Their old budget works fine, but they go, well, we're getting, in the case of Missouri, you know, we're getting an extra $6 billion more than we were the year before. You know, should we go ahead and cut a little bit, you know, to help the people during these tough times? No, nah, they decided to go ahead and spend it on other stuff and, and then have a new budget that was $6 billion higher than the budget before. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. You know, you brought up this point that there is enough silver out there. What it comes down to is the value of it that will determine at what point it, it changes hands, I guess you could say. One of my users sent me an email, uh, and there's, there's a lot of conflicting reports on this, but he said there's about 4 billion ounces of silver above ground right now. And he estimated that 2 billion of that was kind of held by the banks and the other 2 billion was held by private individuals and other investment type ac activities. And um, what's interesting, you brought this up about silver is, I mean, that's, and that's four years worth of mm -hmm. silver production. It's getting about a billion ounces per year. Roughly. Is roughly is that there is a deficit of, you know, according to the silver Institute last year, there were 250 million more ounces that were uh, consumed than were provided by mining and recycling activities. So my rough math, you know, would calculate that in about eight years at this current rate, that that would be uh, eaten through, you know, and, and you brought this up. And I think it's key for us to remember that how much of that <clears throat> silver, and I think you said 70 to 80 percent of it is consumed, right? Mm -hmm. And that the projections, when you look at photovoltaic, you look at the elect electrification of the world and all that, mm -hmm. that the projections are for that to only go up. But at the same time, silver production uh, from mining activities is going down. And then mm -hmm. we look at Mexico, who provides 30 percent of the world's silver. And let's just say that Mexico has, has you know, from a from a regulatory and a government perspective, become very uh, has become very unfriendly toward mining. It's like where where will all this silver come from, um, and 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 at what price? And maybe that's why. And I want to get your comment on this. There's you know you hear a lot of people, and maybe some of them are silver salesmen, <laughs> saying yeah. that silver is one of the most undervalued uh, assets on the face of the earth. If you're looking to buy gold, silver, or platinum, do yourself a favor and check out Pimbex, the online precious metals bullion dealer and sponsor of Ron's Basement. I was a happy customer before they offered to support the channel. You'll find they have the best prices, quality, and service. I think Pimbex is best, and you will too. And be sure to tell them that you're from Ron's Basement. Yeah, I believe that's probably true. Silver is more valuable because of the very thing I told you about. 70 to 80% gets uh, consumed in the industrial process. That is not true with gold. That is mm -hmm. simply not true. Um, in fact, I've heard, and once again, this has to do with uh, uh, David Morgan. I think in a, a newsletter back in 2014, or tw I, I don't remember if it was David Morgan's newsletter, which I do get, um, or someone else's. I think it was something about 10% of gold goes into the industrial process and 90% goes into making uh, coins and other things, jewelry, you know, that sort of thing, things to be treasured, um, things, you know, basically to prevent it from being, you know, just disappearing. And that's simply not true with silver. That's why we have this anomaly where we have so much more uh, gold above ground right now. We have gold above ground that was that was pulled out of the earth, you know, two, three thousand years ago. That's still being treasured to this day. You know, that's that's not true with silver. I mean, silver is just getting used up pretty quick. Silver is so incredibly important to industry. It has properties that no other metals can match. Mm -hmm. You know, and in fact, we, we <clears throat> talked about this on your show before. The industrial process to make graphene is so expensive to compete with silver. That's a carbon composite that competes with silver on, um, you know, basically passing electrons. But I, uh, the last I had read, it was something right around $4,000 an ounce to make graphene. 
So silver should be worth at least that if it's going to be used for that, if silver gets used as money and depositories get set up all over the United States for states to start safeguarding the people's money. So that that's, you know, that's a number that I know make a lot of people happy. I don't like playing fast and loose with how much silver will be worth at some point or how much gold will be worth at some point, because there's an enormous amount of downwards pressure on the prices of gold and silver. And that is led, believe it or not, by the president of the United States. It all starts there because once again, it's the treasury and the treasury Mm -hmm. is an executive branch uh, division. So that's under the president going all the way to COMEX. But London has a lot to do with it, too. Yeah, certainly it's been proven that there's uh, uh, a certain degree of uh, official price suppression in the silver market. But I'm just happy now that I know I can make a thumbnail for this video that says $4,000 silver. Ah. And people are going to know I. But <laughs> <laughs> um, zoom out for one, one second and, mm-hmm. and consider also with silver what's going on in the world, because it's not just the United States, it's the whole world that is demanding more silver. And, you know, like you just mentioned, the COMEX and the LBMA uh, have had kind of a stranglehold on the silver price for the last number of decades. But we're seeing some interesting developments in in China. We have now the Shanghai Gold Exchange, the Shanghai Mm -hmm. Futures Exchange that's trading physical silver. It's a much more physical market from what I understand. And we also have, although we've not heard a lot about it just as of late, but all indications are it's still a go. The Moscow World Standard, which is a new market that the Russians are putting together to trade precious metals. And they've explicitly said that part of their reason for doing that is because they don't think that the the price discovery mechanism in the West, the COMEX and the LBMA, is reflective of an accurate price. Can the world market forces, right? And we all know about this bifurcation going on, but could that force a a revaluation? And I love that word value, revaluation for silver. Any thoughts on that, Pat? First Mining Gold is a development company advancing two of the largest gold projects in Canada, Springpole in Ontario and Duparquet located in Quebec. Each already has 5 million ounces of gold reserves, but exploration initiatives are underway at both projects to find even more gold. First Mining is well-financed, has zero debt, and owns an interest in four additional Canadian gold development projects. Yeah, it could. And, and that goes back to what's going on with the BRICS, you know, and the BRIC nations right now. It definitely could force a revaluation of gold and silver, but I think the West will fight that. You know, they, they will fight it. Uh, they mm-hmm. don't like the idea of gold and silver being money. Real money is anathema to the United States government and the Federal Reserve. Central banks don't have, or I'm sorry, central banks in the West. Mm-hmm. Okay, so let me be very clear about this because your, your viewers are sharp. They'll catch me on mistakes. Uh, but the, the central banks of the West do not get gold and silver. They don't have any. If they do, they're being awfully quiet about it. There's been no news about it. But that's not true with India, Turkey, Russia, China. You know, major players in the East are literally gobbling up gold and silver into their central, their central banks are doing it. So the, the bifurcation you talked about, maybe it's important for people, people to understand what separates the East and the West right now is literally gold and silver. It's just as much as anything else yeah. does. I mean, culturally, we're very different, too, I mean, when it comes to gold and silver. But the fact of the matter is their central banks see a role for gold and silver in the future. They wouldn't be acquiring it otherwise. Now, why did India purchase over 300 million ounces of silver last year? I still yeah. haven't heard a real explanation as to why they gobbled up. Here we are in Thanksgiving season. Uh, you know, more than a third and almost, you know, a, encroaching upon a half of the world's mining production of silver. It's uh, it's crazy. You know, I like to feel like in the end, uh, Mother Nature prevails in the end, free markets prevail, you know, despite the efforts of, of what I think have been, you know, some of the Western governments to suppress uh, the silver and gold price that eventually Market force, Mother Nature prevails, market forces prevail, and it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Yeah. 
And you brought it up. I mean, India, why did they purchase so much silver? I'll tell you what. If you sit down and think about it, they're getting into manufacturing. I'll bet mm -hmm. you anything it has to do with that. They're probably yeah. going to start manufacturing, you know, printed circuit boards, you know, maybe even, you know, a, a multitude of other products. They may be starting pharmaceutical plants there. You don't know. I mean, right. it's possible. Or making equipment that involves so other equipment that involves silver, water filtration. That's going to mm -hmm. be a big issue in China. China is, you know, and it's not like I'm stumping for the EPA here. I am not. I'm, I'm a free market guy, and the EPA is anti-free market. Everyone should be responsible, you know, basically with, with uh, you know, everything they do on Earth. I, I, and I'm talking about waste, pollution, you know, that sort of thing. But the fact of the matter is China doesn't have an EPA, and they have polluted their environment to the point where they have to have water filtration. They have to in China because they've polluted their water tables. Yeah. You know, I, I remember back in the 90s, you know, there were science fiction books being written in the time the Third World War would be over water. You know, so yeah. China has got to filter their water for their people now. So so silver's become very important there, too. So just it's, it's, just my thoughts. It's grown. Well, thank you, Pat. It's 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 growing in importance and stature throughout the world. It'll be interesting to see how it plays out. Now, I want to mention to our viewers that uh, we're going to do another video now where we talk about the current state of legal tender legislation in Missouri and maybe on a national basis as well. You may have some a bit of an update in that regard. But if people want to learn more about you, they go to the Missouri Freedom Initiative dot org. Is that correct? Yep. MoFree.org Mo is our website. We encourage people, particularly if you're in Missouri, to get on our email list. Because we do a lot of stuff in Missouri with gold and silver legislation. Um, we try to help other states with gold and silver legislation. And little birdie told me that you might be interviewing uh, Senator Bill Eigel sometime in the near future, who is the sponsor of the gold and silver as a legal tender bill. So I don't know if that's true or not. I just heard it. I don't remember where. I don't know. Maybe the, maybe the gold bear told you that uh, Senator Eigel may want to sit in the gold bear's chair. We'll have to see how that all works out. Yep. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Pat, you've been a great friend of Ron's basement. Uh, we appreciate on behalf of the viewers, appreciate your time this morning to share your, and you're always super insightful. And uh, we appreciate you sharing this great information with us about silver. And like I said, guys, go watch, the next interview, uh, I'm going to put a link up here at the end of the video where we're going to talk about the legal tender legislation. Thank you, Pat. Thank you, Ron. Have a wonderful day. God bless you.